So as these numbers keep rolling in, I would like to welcome everybody who's joined us today to seven tips from behavioral science to improve your conversions. I'm your host, Nicole Gotzelig, and I'm a senior brand editor here at Hotjar. Joining me today is the one and only Phil Agnew. Phil is a senior product marketer at Buffer, and he's also the host of the Nudge podcast, the UK's top marketing podcast. Before I pass the mic over to Phil, I'd like to start with a poll just to see where everyone is joining us from today. So without further ado, Phil is going to take you through some real life examples along with some tips that you can use to take your marketing from meh to mesmerizing. Once Phil's gone through his um, awesome presentation, we're going to open up the floor to you to ask your questions live to Phil. So we should have a good 15, 20 minutes or so to to answer questions. And uh, Phil's let me know that he he loves to being um, hit with questions. So please don't be shy and add your questions at any time to the Q&A. And we'll take a look at those um, towards the end of the webinar. Um, as we won't have time to answer everyone's questions today, we do have a plan to um, reply to these questions uh, after the webinar. So thank you so much. So without further ado, here is Phil Agnew. Hello. Oh, Nicole, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, very, very excited to be here. Very, very excited and thankful for all of you who have decided to spend an hour of your day listening to me. I mean, I'm very, very grateful for that. And today, if you can all see my screen today, I will be chatting about behavioral science tools to turbocharge your conversions. Now, I know how important conversions are to especially Hotjar customers, who I'm sure many of you are, or people who are interested in Hotjar, you all want to know how to boost your, your conversions. And I want to be talking about behavioral science tools, so tools are backed in psychology that you can apply to your website, to your sign-up flow, whatever it might be, to boost your conversions. We'll start with a bit of a meandering story about behavioral science, and then we'll get into some nitty, hard, useful facts at the end. But yeah, let's start with a little bit about me. I'm Phil Agnew. Um, I host Nudge, which, as Nicole said, is the UK's number one marketing podcast, according to Apple Podcasts, however they measure that. Um, and I'm also senior product marketer at Buffer. Buffer is a, a tool that helps you schedule all of your social posts in advance. If you want to grow your audience organically online, definitely go and check out Buffer, buffer.com. Also head to buffer.com because you could probably see we're applying a few of the things I've been talking about today on our site as well. Um, I'm also a big fan of Hotjar. I used to work at Hotjar as a product marketer as well. So a big fan of, of all the folks over there. Now, my whole the whole thing I do on my on my podcast is try to understand, speak to experts and try to understand why people make the decisions they do and how marketers can use that information to improve their brand, improve their conversions. But I've got a bit of a <laughs> something I want to share, which is a bit surprised as a marketer. I really think that in general, marketing can be incredibly dull. A lot of marketing out there is, is just so glib. It is so intensely focused on positives that all too often it comes across as really superficial. Advertising campaigns, marketing slogans, product launches, they all say the same stuff. They all talk about how great the thing is. Gillette is the best a man can get. KFC is finger licking good. Coca-Cola, you're opening happiness. No matter whether you're looking at D to C, B to C, B to B firms, we all seem to use the same positivity-based slogans. And I'm not surprised. If you want to get somebody to buy something, it makes sense to talk about how great that thing is. If you want to you know, get your roommate to go on a date with a work colleague of yours, you're not going to tell your roommate about how the work colleague puts tuna in the microwave at lunchtime. No, you're not going to highlight negatives. You're going to talk about positives. That's conventional wisdom. But is it right? See, I think that all of us, deep down, know that we're not solely drawn to positive things. Sometimes we prefer negative things. And there's science in the behavioral science world that backs this up. There's a bias we have called the negativity bias. And this shows that in general, if we are displayed positive and negative things, we might be more likely to focus on the negative stuff. You won't be surprised to hear this. If you open up your, your news the app, wherever you look at the news at the moment, you'll see something along this line. You'll read articles about negative things. And on the whole, news articles highlight negative things because we are just more likely to read them. 
YouTube channels make fail compilations that get millions of views while success compilations don't really exist. We have this negativity bias and there is one Instagram account, which I love, which shows this better than any other. And it's this wonderful Instagram account and excuse a bit of bad language on screen here, but it is called Shit London Guinness. And what this Instagram account does is it shares pictures of the worst pints of Guinness that people have been served in London. So Guinness that is served in the wrong glass, Guinness with a head that is too big, Guinness with a head that is too small. And it's got 150,000 followers or 167,000 followers when I took this screenshot. And what's amazing about this is when you compare shit London Guinness to UK's official Guinness account, you notice that it's got 10 times as many followers as the UK official account. We are drawn towards negativity. We are drawn towards things that are imperfect. And yet, if you suggested a marketing campaign that talked about your product's negatives, something like this, you'd probably get laughed at. If you told McDonald's to change their slogan from I'm loving it to I've only got four pounds, so this will have to do, you get kicked out of the marketing you know, department. But this, I think, is, is a bit of you know, marketing rubbish because it's based on what marketers think work rather than on what actually works. It's marketing that is based on opinion rather than marketing that is based on fact. And the thing is, we can base our understanding of marketing on science if we look to apply it, if we look to embrace it. The problem I think at the moment is that most marketing decisions are based on gut instinct. And a lot of website decisions as well are based on gut instinct as well. Sure, we've got a lot of data, but the way we interpret that is, is usually down to what we perceive might be right or wrong. The thing is, and this obviously means that we're living in the sort of age of the Mad Men era where we're just doing what we feel to be right rather than what actually might be right. But the thing is, we could apply some science. We could apply some behavioral science to this. And I think if we do, we'll get much better results because we've spent hundreds of years analyzing how people make decisions. And during that process, we've understood many, many hundreds of different biases that all of us have that dictate our decisions. And if we as marketers try to understand these biases, we can make our marketing a lot more potent. So I'll go through a few examples now, a few tools you can use and show the real science behind how they work. So one you've probably heard of is social proof. Now, social proof is the idea that we follow the actions of others. So this is an evolutionary idea. As cavemen, if we saw a bunch of other cavemen running, sprinting out of a cave, we're not going to go in that cave. We'll run with them away. We'll follow the actions of others. We've evolved to do that because it keeps us safe. It means we don't get eaten by the lion that might be in the cave in this example. But it also means today that if you're walking down the high street and you see a bunch of people looking into a shop window or a bunch of people queuing outside a restaurant, you'll want to do the same thing. That's social proof. Now, in websites, I think we're maybe a bit we're a bit relaxed about social proof. Sure, we put some customer testimonials on the website. Sure, we say, oh, we're also used by brand X, Y, and Z. But I think we could use it in a much more effective way. There's an example that I love which showcases this. It's an example from Richard Shotton's brilliant book, The Choice Factory. And in this book, Richard Shotton, the author, went into a, a London pub and asked the barman, what's been your best-selling beer for the past week? And the barman said, oh, I, think, I think it's London Pride in the example. The barman says, oh, it was London Pride. And Richard Shotton says, you know, would you mind if I ran a bit of an experiment for the following week? All I want to do is put a little sign hanging on that on that um, on that beer, so the London Pride beer, just telling people that this is the best selling beer. Just telling people this was the best selling beer of the previous week. And the barman said, "Yeah, sure, go for it." And and he Richard asked the barman to compare the sales in the weeks uh, before and the weeks after the sign going up, and the results were astounding. Sales increased by 2.5 times. And what's interesting about this is that sales for London Pride went up dramatically. So loads of people tried this beer when they knew it was popular. But sales of other beers didn't go down. People were drawn to try that beer in addition to the uh, beers they were already drinking. That's the power of social proof. Just merely saying what is popular drives people's action. So if you've got a pricing page with multiple different um, variants, you should be telling people what the most popular variant is because it can drive action.
Okay, that's social proof. Let's rattle through a few more. So we've got the endowment effect. The endowment effect is the idea that we feel ownerships over tasks that have already begun. So if you've already started to write an email, you're more likely to finish. The best thing you can do if you've got something tricky that you have to do is start it. If you want to do a 5K, but you really can't be bothered, just go and say you're going to run 1K and you'll be more likely to finish it. There's a wonderful study which showcases how this can be applied in marketing. The study was with loyalty cards, the loyalty cards you get when you go to a cafe and you ask for a a coffee. And in the study, the baristas gave out two variants of different loyalty cards. One loyalty card had seven stamps that you needed to collect until you got your free coffee. The other loyalty card had nine stamps that you needed to collect, so two more. But as the barista handed it over to you, they stamped in the first two stamps. So an economist would look at this and say, ah, there's no difference. People in both groups have to go and buy seven more coffees in order to get a free coffee. There should be no difference in the behavior of the two groups. But the behavioral scientist and the psychology says, well, that's not the case. Because we know once a task has already begun, we're more likely to complete it. And in that variant where the barista stamps in the first two coffees for you, people are 82% more likely to keep coming back in order to get that free coffee by the end. This is why when you're onboarding users onto your platform, especially if it's a web or digital platform, showing the completion rate is so important. Let's do another one, loss aversion. This is the idea that losses loom larger than gains. So if I gave you £100, it wouldn't feel as good as losing £100 would feel bad. Losing feels worse. A bit like that negativity bias at the start. This this thing's really stick in our mind. Um, If you're a sports fan, you'll know this all too well. Wins pale into insignificance, but losses, they loom larger. And Amazon are a company that use this very effectively in their marketing to keep people subscribed to Amazon Prime and to stop churn. So this is what most companies would write if you were about to leave a subscription. It would say Amazon Prime or Netflix, or whatever it would be. Oh, let's talk about all the positives that we offer. We offer free delivery. We offer exclusive benefits. Are you sure you want to cancel? Amazon don't do that. They show you exactly what you'll be losing. So they, this is actual, actually what they said when I tried to ca- uh, cancel in 2019. They said, Phil, you have saved 313 quid in delivery fees by being a Prime member. Not telling me to stay subscribed, just saying how much money I've saved. And loss aversion will kick in when I see that message and make me more likely to resist um, leaving the platform. And Richard Chataway, a wonderful behavioral scientist who wrote the book Behavior of Business, he looked into this with Amazon and found that that message resulted to a 42% reduction in churn. Simply saying what you're going to lose made people less likely to churn. Another wonderful example that you can apply to a website as well, but it's not my favorite because my favorite is anchoring. Anchoring is the idea that the initial piece of information we see when we're encountering something, especially if it's something that we're, we're not familiar with, heavily impacts our judgment. So we are anchored by the initial piece of information we see. Um, loads of examples of this, but I'm going to show you show you one of my favorite ones. And it's a marketing example from Phil Barden's brilliant book, Decoded. And in his example, uh, Snickers were releasing ice creams. Some of you might have tried these. These are sort of Snicker, Snickers ice creams, a bit like Snickers bar, but with ice cream in them. And when they released these, they tried two different types of messaging in the supermarket aisles uh, by the freezer. And the first type of messaging said, buy Snickers for your freezer. So you don't have to be a marketing professor to come up with a bit of copy like that. Pretty much the most basic marketing copy you could create. But it works. It got people to buy the ice cream. And on average, people bought around 1.4 bars. So most people bought one, but a couple of, you know, a fair few people would go and buy a few more bars. And then they tweaked the message slightly. So no creative genius required here. They just changed the anchor. Rather than saying buy a Snickers for your freezer, they said buy 18 Snickers for your freezer. Now, this is ridiculous. Nobody was buying 18 originally. (laughs) Nobody was getting even close to that. So this shouldn't really have an effect on behavior. But it acts as an anchor in the same way that if you go and look at a menu and you see a really expensive wine, say for 100 quid for a bottle, looking at a 30 pound bottle of wine suddenly looks like a good deal. Rather than say, if you went to a restaurant and you saw that all of the bottles of wine were 10 pounds, whereas one was 30 pounds, suddenly that seems like really expensive. So this is working in the same way by 18 Snickers for your freezer. And what happened? Well, they found that on average, customers bought 2.6 bars per customer. So the amount people bought almost doubled in this scenario, simply with a little bit of anchoring. 
Now, one that so many of you will know, especially if maybe there's anybody working at booking.com here, you'll definitely know this one, the idea behind scarcity. So scarce resources are, are just stuff that we love, we crave. It's why we queue up for ages um, to get into a small restaurant. It's why we spend all this time online when tickets to Glastonbury go out on sale. Um, there's a great example of this, which Rich, um, Robert Cialdini talks about in his book, Influence, where the day that British Airways announced that Concorde would stop flying in like six months time, Concorde would stop flying between the UK and New York. The day that happened, the tickets for the remaining flights sold out in almost minutes. Nothing had changed about the flight. The flight was the same. The customer service was the same. The price was the same. It was just a scarce resource and it caused people to take action. And if you add a bit of scarcity to your website, you get all these amazing interactions. So there's one brilliant example of this. Again, it's from the Behavioral Business book, which I talked about earlier by Richard Chataway. And in this example, KFC had an offer. The offer was fairly good. They had chips for a dollar available to buy and get delivered to your door. Chips for a dollar in Australia, it's a good deal. And so um, the company that owns KFC is called Yum Yum Brands, I believe, and they spend $3 billion a year on marketing and advertising. So they have within their company some of the very best copywriters on this planet, some of the most creative geniuses when it comes to advertising. And they got them to write as many different variants for this this uh, Facebook ad, which is what they were creating, as many different variants as they could come up with. And there's some really smart stuff. The Colonel has never been so generous. From Perth to Brisbane, they loved Aussie right wide. You know, these are smart, creative messages that are built to make people want to buy and desire this offer. They tested all of them. They did an A, B, C, D, E, F test on Facebook with all 90 different messages and saw which one was clicked the most, which one drove the most sales. And you know what's going to happen because you've probably you've probably seen it already. But the one that drove the most sales was none of this creative genius. It was chips for a dollar, limited to four per customer. That tiny bit of scarcity made the message more potent, made people more likely to buy, even though they weren't actually limiting them, which we can get into the ethics later. But just having that bit of scarcity, just implying that bit of scarcity, made people more likely to buy. Okay, I've bamboozled you there with way too much. So I'm going to spend a bit more time on this last one because it links to the point I talked about at the start. And I think it's a really, really interesting one. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Prattful effect, because the Prattful effect is this bias that shows that we're not drawn to things that are perfect, a bit like the negativity bias that I talked about at the start. It's why shit London Guinness has so many followers. And it's why McDonald's could benefit from occasionally changing their slogan from I'm loving it to I've only got a few quid. And this isn't just opinion, this is backed up by science. There is a wonderful study on this, which was conducted back in 1966 by a psychologist named Elliot Aronson. And in the study, Aronson recorded films of actors. Now, the participants wouldn't know this was an actor, but they were an actor. And they correctly answered a bunch of quiz, answered a bunch of quiz questions correctly, getting 92% of the, the questions correct. So these actors looked very smart, looked very competent. However, after answering the final question, one of the actors would accidentally spill coffee all over themselves and down their trousers. Now, this uh, video of the actor spilling coffee down themselves and getting 92% of the questions right was then shown to a group of participants. And the participants were asked, how much do you like this quiz, uh, this quiz uh, contestant? Um, so one group saw that version, and then the other group saw the same actor getting the same amount of questions right, but who didn't spill the coffee down themselves. So it still has the same amount of intelligence, just doesn't clumsily spill coffee down themselves. And they were also asked, how much do you like this quiz contestant? And what was interesting is that the actor who spilled coffee down himself was rated as considerably more likable. It's weird. It shouldn't be right. Why should spilling coffee down yourself make yourself more likable? But it does. It's a powerful effect. Some combination of benefit and negative makes people trust and like this person more. The powerful effect made the actor seem more appealing, increasing his approachability and making him seem more human. That's what Aronson said back in the 1960s. And this has been repeated today. A similar study was carried out by uh, Joe Sylvester at Swansea University. And in this study, Joe got researchers to essentially go and interview for jobs. Now, these researchers were sure to... Um, basically make all of their sort of characteristics and CV and everything, all of their experience look identical. Where possible, they would do these interviews um, virtually without showing their face. So no sort of a demographic influence could come in here. And where possible, they would just send in CVs as well. 
using gender neutral names. So in this scenario, these researchers would apply for lots of different jobs. They would always have the same skills, the same experience, the same strengths. There was only one difference between some of the researchers and the others. And that was that some of the researchers would share a weakness. They would say, I'm great at all this stuff, but by the way, I'm really bad at admin or I'm, I'm awful at finances and, and, and numbers. Now you would imagine, that the researchers who only shared positives, the interviewees who only shared positives, were more likely to get the job, were more likely to get called into an interview, were more likely to get to the next round. But that wasn't the case. The ones who showed a weakness were considered more likable and thus were far more likely to get offered a job and get pushed to the next round. Highlighting your weakness or revealing your flaw, perhaps by spilling coffee down yourself, increases your likability, makes you more likable. This is applied to people, but apparently it can also be applied to products as well. Consumer psychologist Adam Ferrier, who I spoke to about this on my podcast Nudge, he sent a representative sample of 626 people this question about cookie. They were shown these two cookies and they were asked, which one do you like the look of more? Cookies obviously are, are identical, except one cookie had a rough, imperfect edge, while the other was perfectly smooth. And they found that the favorite was this imperfect cookie, where you know, it had this rough edge. And sure, you could say that makes it more look, make it make it makes it look more home baked, more home cooked. Nevertheless, it's showcasing that this flaw, you know, seems to boost positivity. The problem is most marketers do not highlight imperfection. How often do you go to a website and read about something not being perfect? You don't. But there are some campaigns which have stood the test of time which do apply this negative. So you've got this wonderful campaign by uh, Buckley, a US cough, cough medicine company, that have the slogan, it tastes awful and it works. And this slogan must be working because they kept it for the last 40 years. Highlighting a flaw can be really successful. Listerine used to do something similar as well. Back in the 70s, they ran a poster ad that read, I hate it, but I love it. I love it. Let me tell you, it tastes lousy, but that's why it works so good. Just like those actors who spilled a bit of coffee down themselves, just like those job interviewees who revealed a weakness, highlighting a flaw along alongside a benefit seemed to be really successful in terms of creating marketing. These ads are few and far between these days, and it seems like most marketers are moving away from negativity. Um, and But there are some examples where even today people are using it to great success. So this is an ad from um, the Snowbird Ski Resort, which was originally only published in a magazine. And that was until a few fans started sharing the ad on social media because they loved the ad so much. And another wrote a media medium article on it and it took off. According to Google, this image has been published over 5,000 times online. Now it went pr truly viral. Why? Well, I think it's because it highlights negativity again. You know, it's saying this uh, snow resort, I give it one star out of five. It is too advanced. It's not fun. It's all the things that are bad about a resort. And again, it's a bit tongue in cheek. There is a positive there. They're highlighting that it's not fun for them because it's too hard. But still, this is marketing you don't see usually because people are usually too afraid to say that there's something not very good about their product. Now, I'm aware that this is my a little bit of my subjective opinion. I'm looking at these ads and thinking, oh, I think they're working because they're highlighting negativity. Some of you could look at them and say, oh, it's something else, it's something else, it's something else. So I wanted to prove that this works myself. I wanted to test the Prattful effect out in my own marketing to make sure it works. So I set up a test. Um, and it was one to show that the Prattful effect wasn't a gimmick. And in this test, I would promote my podcast, Nudge. And I would promote it on Reddit. I chose Reddit because I've got, in Reddit, you can basically advertise to specific subreddits. So I can go and pick all the subreddits that are relevant for people who might want to listen to Nudge. So, you know, folks who are interested in marketing, folks who are interested in growth, entrepreneurs, folks who are interested in digital marketing, that sort of thing. I would make sure I was targeting the right group. And then for this group, I created two Reddit ads and alongside the copy, there'll be a little picture as well. The first ad was your traditional textbook marketing 101, how to market your product. And it was talking through five reasons why you should listen to my show. So all the positives, basically. I said, you'll learn the science behind great marketing. Guests include people like Rory Sutherland, Nir Ayle, Richard Shotton. At the time, at had 100,000 downloads with 127 five-star reviews. Episodes are 20 minutes long with no fluff and no ads. You'll learn the marketing science that you can replicate. Now, I'll admit, this is not the world's most creative copy. It's not great. 
But it's sort of what the textbooks tell us to do. It's what we're advised to do in our marketing. And most of us follow this line when we're thinking about copy for our website or copy for our ads. Let's highlight all of the positives. And then I created the advert number two. And this was the one that applied the Prattful effect. And it was titled, literally, Five Reasons Why You Shouldn't, in capital letters, Listen to Nudge. It said, you'll realize how useless your marketing degree was. Episodes are packed with so many examples, you might get a headache. You'll piss off your colleagues with your great new ideas. It's only 20 minutes long, which isn't ideal for long car journeys. And you'll learn marketing science, not great LinkedIn guru wisdom. And I'll be honest, I know that this is a bit tongue in cheek. I know that these negatives aren't truly negative. There's some positives behind them. But I really still didn't think it would work. I was literally telling people, not to listen to my show. I was I was worried people would see this and think, God, this people hate this show so much. They're advertising to let people know about it. So I was fairly certain I was taking this effect too far and that this wouldn't work. But I went ahead with the with the ad. I spent around five hundred dollars in total. Over three hundred thousand people saw the ad, and yeah, I couldn't believe the result because not only did the Prattful effect outperform the control, it was dramatically better, four times more effective. The click-through rate for the control was was really low, like 0.01%, whereas for the Prattful effect, it was 0.5%. I got a 400% lift in telling people not to listen to my show. Over 500 new listeners came to the show, which I could measure through a, a tool called Chartable. And today, it's probably one of my most effective bits of marketing. I've been, I've been replicating this for a while since then. And yet, this is something you would really struggle to do in a business. Your boss wouldn't dare let you try something that says, don't buy this product, don't use this. Um, but often it pays to be different. Often it pays to apply science to marketing. And sure, you might not apply this nudge in particular, but you might apply anchoring or you might apply scarcity. And taking a bit of science, testing it and applying it can give you the edge over your competition. And there's no better example of someone getting an edge over their competition by applying stuff like this than this guy. So to finish up, I want to share one of my favorite examples of someone benefiting from the Prattful effect. This is Stephen Bradbury. He was a speed skater who represented Australia at the 2002 Winter Olympics. Now, the, the Winter Olympics are not a big deal in Australia. You won't be surprised to hear that. It's not very cold over there. So it was a major su surprise when Stephen made the final of his competition. Stephen was a speed skater and he was racing against the fastest speed skaters on the planet. He had to race them over a thousand meters going round and round an ice rink. He was easily the slowest person there. And he was also the oldest person racing as well, which doesn't help. And it was an absolute fluke that he made the final and he really stood no chance of winning. So rather than focus on all his positives, how much training he's put in, how he's the best in Australia, and just try and go for it and embrace your strengths, he decided to embrace his flaw. He built his strategy around this Prattful effect, use your weakness to your advantage. Bradbury knew that every other racer in the race was desperate to win. For them, only winning gold would do. Anything else would be a failure. So he could have tried to compete with the other people, you know, bouncing up against them, trying to get to the front. But that would have only meant one of two things. He would have either A, tired himself out and fallen too far behind, or probably even more likely, because this is very common in speed skating, he would have fallen over very quickly. Trying to keep up with them, he would have fallen over and he wouldn't have finished. So his Prattful inspired strategy was simple. Skate a few meters behind the other four, let them battle it out, stay in their slipstream and just hope one of them falls down. So this is what he did. This video is incredible to watch, by the way. If, if you have time afterwards, go and look it up. For the entire race, he just sits two, three, four meters behind the pack, makes an absolutely no attempt to take any of them over, quite happy to sit there at the back. Eventually, it becomes obvious he's going to finish last. But then, <laughs> 10 meters before the end, going around the final corner, the Russian fell. And when the Russian fell, he took out the American. And when the American fell, he took out the Canadian and he took out the Chinese with him. And meters from the finish line, all four skaters were lying on the ice. And Bradbury, you can see the surprise in his face. He just went past them, crossed the finish line before they could get up. And just like that, Stephen Bradbury became the first athlete in the entire southern half of the planet to win a gold at the Winter Olympics. Not by fighting to compete, not by focusing on positives, but by embracing his flaw, using his weakness to his strength. Now, I've applied this to my podcast. We've seen how job seekers can apply this. 
But you might be thinking, okay, how can I apply this at a branding level? Well, there's a wonderful example of this that I can share as well. And you, a lot of the people in the UK will have heard it. It is, of course, Marmite. If you're not in the UK, you might not have heard of Marmite. It is a yeast extract spread. That is not what makes it interesting. Um, it's it, it's not what makes it tasty either. What makes Marmite interesting is how it consistently highlights its flaws. In fact, their slogan is actually, you'll either love it or you'll hate it. This is their slogan. This is what they spend all their time advertising. You'll either love it or you're hating. They're suggesting that a vast majority or maybe vast minority of people literally hate their brand. Now, this type of campaign, it goes against all of the marketing textbook, all of the common rules that you would suggest, but it consistently gets results. In fact, one variant of this campaign, which was launched in 2014, was an eight-week eight week campaign, which slightly tweaked the love it or hate it slogan. In this version, Marmite was pictured as being left at the back of the cupboard, unused and unopened for months. The campaign called End Marmite Neglect, this was the campaign, it was highlighting the fact that most for most customers, Marmite was barely used. Sure, you earned one little jar of Marmite, but you hadn't. It was in the back of your cupboards, covered in cobwebs, you hadn't used it for years. Yeah, and showcasing this weakness, suggesting this flaw, their sales soared. The brand saw a 14% increase in year-on-year -year sales. They generated an additional £37 million in revenue. And the advert helped them bag the 2014 Brand of the Year title at the Marketing Week Engage Awards. That is the, the, the real power, I think, of applying science to marketing and avoiding the sort of rubbish marketing textbook stuff that a lot of us opt for. Now, I'm sure some of you are probably thinking, hold on, hold on, Phil. I came here for website conversions. What is all this rubbish about speed skaters that you've been boring me with for half an hour? So to finish up, I'm going to give you a real quick fire look at loads of different ways that you can apply behavioral science tactics to websites to increase your conversion, to improve your website. Now, each of them will be a different tactic. It will be based on a different nudge. So I'll give a very quick example of what the nudge is and then a very quick example of how you can apply it. So... Let's dive into 11 different examples that you could test out on your website today. Now, we'll start with one which is called the distinctness effect or the von Resterhoff effect. This is the idea that distinct items increase recall. It was discovered way back in 1933 by Hedwig von Resterhoff. She showed participants long lists of letters that they needed to remember. And then within that list, there would also be a, a list of numbers that they would have to remember as well, just one list of numbers. Lo and behold, when the numbers is the unique things, people are 30 times more likely to remember it. If you flip it and the, the letters are the unique things, people are 30 times more likely to remember the letters. Richard Shotton has proven in 2018 that the same is true for brand. If you are distinct, you stand out and you get better recall. So Forest Green Rovers, a football club in the lower leagues over here in the UK, they don't do what every other football club does which is say, join the mighty Forest Green Rovers on their mobile website. That's not distinct. Wouldn't get them any more fans than they would otherwise be used to. Instead, they build their brand around being green. They build their brand around being the world's first green football club and call themselves the greenest football club, which is an award they've been given to FIFA by as well. By investing in their distinctiveness, they stand out. And I think they've got some interesting stat, which is for the capacity, for, for the size of the town they're based in, which to be fair is a very small town, they get the highest percentage, the highest ratio of town uh, population actually visiting their ground. They're the only town where more people come to the game than people who actually live in the town nearby. So this strategy of being distinct really works for them. All right, let's give you another one. So this is the nudge, which is based around specific numbers. So if you want something to be believable, especially if you're in a negotiation, giving a specific number is more believable and trustworthy than a rounded number. So if you're going for a promotion and you want to raise, the science would suggest that you should ask for a raise of um, $8,553 rather than $8,000 because being specific makes it more trustable and more reliable. And Waze don't apply this on their website, but I think they could. I think they could boost downloads by using something like this, saying the exact number of drivers and riders who hate traffic to. By applying these nudges, you make your copy more believable and encourage people to take action. All right, let's give another one. Comedy can help build trust and memorability. If you use a bit of comedy in your marketing copy, it makes it seem more believable, makes your brand seem more realistic. So this, which is a vegan food producer, 
They don't say your email address will not be shared with any of our external partners nor sold for data, which is what I'm pretty sure all of us put on our website. They say something much more believable, much more enjoyable, and much more memorable as well. They say, we'll only sell your data if someone offers us a really good price. That's a joke. We're 100% do not sell your email. Weirdly, the comedic version is more trustworthy. By telling a joke, it makes people more likely to believe it and far more likely to put their email address in the subscribe button. So use a bit of comedy to build trust and memorability. Let's keep going. Uh, this is one that some of you will know, hopefully many of you will know, and it's around charm pricing. So nine ending prices make a price or a product look more appealing. So having a nine end to your price makes it look more appealing. There are lots of reasons. There's lots of theories about why this is the case. Some of it is because, especially in um, Latin languages, you read from left to right. And so the first number you see will be a lower one if you have a nine ending price. So rather than this being a thousand, it would be not a thousand, it'd be 900. Technically, that's a lower number um, in this scenario. Apple some people say often when you talk about charm prices, charm prices as well, oh, this is something that cheap brands do. I only use, I would only use a nine ending price if I was a cheap brand. Well, Apple apply this to every single one of their products. Go on apple.com today and you will see all of their products priced like this from 999, from 1299. They apply it because they've done enough tests to prove it works. This is definitely worth testing for your, your site. Try charm pricing, see if it works for you. Another great example is around recall. So something that is very, very well known, not just by marketers, but especially by speech writers and politicians, is that rhyming helps improve recall. Some of the oldest sayings that have survived in English language and, and just language in general are rhyming sayings. And marketers could use this today. Um, beans means Heinz is a wonderful example of, of rhyming used in advertising, which has won multiple awards and increased recall. And Pitch, which I'm using to present this whole presentation, do this wonderfully in their copy. They don't say swap to pitch, they say switch to pitch. All that does helps boost recall, helps increase fluency, helps you understand what they're selling quicker and dramatically increases their conversions as well. Maybe not dramatically increases, hopefully increases, but definitely boosts their recall too. Um, another one that I love is social proof. We spoke about social proof at the start. Now, one of the things a lot of people say when, they, when we're talking about social proof is, well, the problem is, Phil, my brand's not big enough. I don't have a big brand. I, I'm not the number one in my category. There are bigger competitors for me. I can't say I'm the most popular beer, for example. I'm not. Um, there are ways you can get around this. One way is called dynamic social proof. So instead of highlighting how big you are, you say how much you're growing. There's a wonderful study about this um, done in American restaurants where they tried to convince people, meat eaters, to eat a vegan um, option. And they put little plaques down that said, three out of 10 Americans try a vegan option once a week, um, maybe try one today. That reduced the amount of people who would try a vegan option. Knowing that the minority try that option is called negative social proof. Less people did it. So don't say three out of 10 Americans try social, uh, try a ve vegan options. When they tweaked that message to the number of Americans trying vegan options has risen by 75% within the last three years, that increased the amount of people who tried the vegan option. So using dynamic social proof, showing how much you're growing can really help. So, um, this is a good example of how you could try this with Starling. Rather than saying millions of accounts across the UK join Starling, you could say someone joins Starling every 38 seconds. You could try that on yourself on your website. Everybody's got a number, which is quite impressive like that. Break it right down, say how often people join you, and that can spark social proof, even if you're not a big brand. Okay, another wonderful example. Um, if you go to a restaurant and you see the food being cooked for you, you enjoy it more. This, this is what studies um, cited in HBR have found, and it's why loads of restaurants now have no sort of barriers between you and the food. Seeing the chef cook your meal makes you enjoy it more. Going behind the scenes, doing a tour at a brewery, for example, will make you enjoy the beer more. Um, doing all sorts of things where you understand the labor that has got into something will make you enjoy it more. If I told you at the start of this presentation that I've spent 50 hours 
preparing this presentation, you probably would have enjoyed that presentation more. I would have been lying though, so I didn't say that. However, you can use this labor illusion in lots of ways to boost your conversion. So rather than saying order food to your door on Uber Eats, Uber could say something like this, 426 chefs are cooking near you right now, showcasing that there's labor that is happening around you, showcasing that people are working on something that will benefit you, can make people far more likely to buy, can make people spend more as well, could be a really good way to boost conversions. Um, another wonderful example is this example of the power of free. So the power of free was, was discovered by Dan Ariely, who wrote the brilliant book, Predictably Irrational. Many of you might have re uh, read this book. He's he's had a few things challenged by people, especially some around some of his number um, his data around trustworthiness, which is weird to be challenged on trustworthiness for research on trustworthiness. But his stuff on the power of free is pretty is pretty foolproof. In his studies, he gave people um, a Hershey Kiss and a, a Ferrero Rocher, I believe. I don't really know these chocolates. I know the Ferrero Rocher, but I believe a Hershey's Kiss is is well known for being less enjoyable. Than the Ferrero Rocher. Um, so in the example, he said, would you like the Ferrero Rocher for 50p or the Hershey Kiss for 49p? Everyone picks the Ferrero Rocher. 1p more for a better chocolate. Why wouldn't you pick that? He then dropped the price by 50 pence. So now the Ferrero Rocher was 1 pence and the Hershey Kiss was 0 pence. And now, despite the difference in price being the same, just 1p, everybody picked the Hershey Kiss. That is the power of free. It's the free things make us take action. So rather than Amazon saying, uh, we're giving you 10% off your 12 month Amazon Prime membership, claim your 10% discount to get people to sign up. They say, we're giving you 30 days of Amazon Prime for free. Small, subtle nudge that can increase conversions. Okay, a couple more to go through. So hyperbolic discounting, um, strange, big, a theory, but it's basically the idea that if you break your price down into smaller increments, it'll make it seem more appealing. So this is Descript. It's a tool, a SaaS tool, and they don't say, oh, this will cost you $288 per editor per year. They break their price down to a smaller amount and they say this will cost you $24 per editor per month. This is really something worth testing. Um, Richard Shotton did some tests with car the car manufacturer Mazda and found that even if you go further, breaking down by week or even day still increases the likelihood that people will buy. Um, I don't see many SaaS companies trying the by week or by day option. I think it's worth testing. So if you are one of them, go and give it a go. Another great example, and Nicole would have been using this uh, in trying to get people to come to this webinar today. So you've definitely experienced this. This is the curiosity gap. So this is ancient, you know, common knowledge. Uh, it's what Charles Dickens used to keep people reading Great Expectations, which was originally published in multiple different uh, newspapers. He would leave a cliffhanger at the end of each one. Uh, it's Ar Arabian Nights, which is one of the oldest tales to survive, has a cliffhanger at the end of each of the stories. And this is the idea. The reason why why all of these great stories have this is because of something called a curiosity gap. We feel an intense desire to satisfy our curiosity. So showcasing or, or, or hinting at something, hinting at a story can make people more likely to, to click. Some people call it clickbait. I think it's it's been going on for a lot longer than the internet. So it's not a new thing. So rather than saying, join this newsletter, new tips every week, Caitlin Borgoyne for her newsletter says, the first tip will blow your mind. Again, bit buzzfeedy, bit clickbaity, but this is another thing that's worth trying if you want to increase your conversions. Last tip, everyone, and then we're going to do questions. Weber's law. It is easier to commit to small changes. Making a change seem small and actionable makes it easier to commit to. You know, Rather than saying, I want to climb Everest this year, say you're going to go on your first 5k run and it will make it easier to feel like you're going to get there. Brain FM, apply this, not by saying functional music to improve focus fast, but by simply saying functional music to improve focus in 15 minutes. Breaking down your value to make it seem easier and simpler will make people more likely to take action. Okay, that was a bunch of different behavioral science concepts for all of you to use. Loads of different ways you can apply these concepts to your website and conversions. If you want to learn more, if you've enjoyed hearing about behavioral science and how you can apply it, then I would love for you to check out my podcast. It is called Nudge. The logo looks like this. Search for it wherever you get your podcasts. And there are over 150 episodes where we go into heaps of detail on similar stuff that I've talked about today. So go and check out Nudge podcast if you're interested in learning more about how to 
apply behavioral science to your marketing and how to increase your conversions. And I think, Nicole, we've got about 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 13 minutes to do some questions. Is that right? We absolutely do. And there are so many questions that have come in, and I'm so thankful for that. Mm. One question, um, Phil, I noticed there there was a general theme coming up in these questions, and we got lots of questions, and it was about how can we apply some of these principles or techniques to B2B marketing? And is there really a big difference between B2B and B2C? Yeah, really good question. Um, Ultimately, behavioral science works because you're understanding the human who, who is making a decision at the other end. So it's, it's, it's about understanding how humans make decisions ultimately. And in both B2C, where you're selling to a direct consumer, or B2B, where you're selling to someone out of business, you're still dealing with humans. So those all of these examples I've shared, it doesn't matter whether you're using them on a B2B site or a B2C site, they should work for both for both scenarios because you know B2B and B2C are still working with humans. Now, that doesn't mean that some nudges aren't more effective in different spaces. Social proof, for example, saying millions of people use this thing that is far more effective in B2C because they know the audience base is bigger. If you say that in B2B, it can come across a bit disingenuous. Saying that millions of people use my expensive real estate agents might actually weaken the amount of um, interest in it as well because it makes it seem less exclusive. So it's really worth testing this stuff out, making sure it works for you. But in general, yeah, works for B2B, works for B2C. Thank you, Phil. Okay, we've got another one here from Igor. Igor is asking, behavioral science is a hot topic in marketing. What if every company starts using these principles, thus making people develop some kind of immunity to these nudges? I thought about this one too. So this is a great question. It's a really good one, isn't it? So Daniel Kahneman, who probably started all of this, he wrote the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, one of the first behavioral economists to really popularize behavioral science. He won the Nobel Prize for his work as well. He was asked this question and he was asked, are you like a superhuman, Daniel? Like, do you go to websites and you don't get fooled by anything? Do you never gamble? Have you never eaten fast food in your life? Um, Have you never spent the the sort of evening on your sofa because you can't stop scrolling Instagram? And he's like, no, knowing about this doesn't actually help you sort of get around it. We still have these monkey brains inside our heads that are wired to take all the shortcuts we take. The the thing that we would miss out on, and this is the thing that I would encourage marketers to think about now is as these marketing cam- t- mar- marketing styles and tactics become more prevalent, more and more of your competitors are going to start to use them and more and more of your competitors are going to get an advantage. So what's really important right now is to get the first mover advantage and, and start to apply as many of these stuff as possible as soon as possible because it will give you that edge over your competitors. Now, even in a world where this is saturated and lots of people are doing it, it's still worthwhile doing it. Take a look at advertising today. Pretty much every company that has ever listed on any stock exchange does advertising. Tesla do, even though they say they don't. They do. (laughs) So every single person does it. And that doesn't mean people don't have stopped advertising because everyone's doing it. It's just a core part of the marketing mix. And I think behavioral science will go the same way. Yeah. And sometimes it's like a snowball effect. You know, once you try a couple and you're like, yeah, this is working and this is working and this is working, it can boost your confidence to to want to keep trying more and more and more. Uh, And sometimes in marketing, as you're saying, it can be very dull and we can get bogged down into just trying to convert, trying to convert. And sometimes just a little few tweaks here and there uh, can make you stand out in the crowd. So thank you. We've got another question here from Lauren. Uh, Phil, loving it so far. Smiley face. Any good book book recommendations to dig more into these principles? Yeah, loads. Um, Do message me uh, directly if you want my full list. I've got a big list of book recommendations. Um, I'm on Twitter, P underscore Agnew, A-G-N-E-W, or on LinkedIn, Phil Agnew on there. Message me, send me a DM. I'll send you a big list. But the ones I would always recommend are Choice Factory by Richard Shotton. It's a really good introduction to behavioral science, really good way to just understand loads of the principles and how you can apply them. Influence by Robert Cialdini. He's probably the godfather of of applying behavioral science to marketing and to persuasion and sales. So it's a really good one to gain a, a lot of knowledge on that subject really quickly. And then, yeah, if you are really, really honing in on on conversions and stuff like that there's a book called don't make me think which is a really good book on ux design applies a little bit of nudge theory and stuff like that to your website too so that can be another one Um, those are the ones i would suggest to get started 
That's great. You know, and we can come up with um, a list or maybe we can do a post um, as well with some of your book recommendations. I'm already thinking of a, um, a uh, blog opportunity between us, Phil. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. So another great question from Amy. Uh, Phil, when are you using the pratfall effect too much? Like how many is too many flaws? Like I spill coffee on myself all the time. Mm. Like, is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, I love this question, Amy. Thank you. Um, so there is a really important thing to consider when you're doing the practical effect. And in Elliot Aronson's study, he had a variant of the study where the, uh, the, the quiz contestant, the actor, got far, far fewer of the questions right. So got like 50% of the questions right. So didn't have that level of competence um, that the others had. And when this actor spilt coffee down themselves, they were considered less likable when they, when they didn't. So the, the practical effect is really beneficial when you're matching a positive with a negative. The reason my ad did well is because I'm saying, don't listen to nudge because you'll just you'll just learn too much. The Snowbird um, Resort ad is good because it's saying, don't come to our resort because you're probably not good enough to come here. Like it's really high quality. And so if you're using the practical effect to the extent where you're actually hiding all your positives, where, you're, where it just looks pure, purely negative, that's wrong. You would never go into a job interview and, and say, here are all my weaknesses and there's nothing else. Matching weaknesses with skills and strengths is the way to do it. So that's the balance you need to find of, of, of highlighting a flaw whilst also showcasing your negative, your positives as well. Thank you, Phil. There are so many great questions in here. I'm getting a little bit uh, excited. Actually, here's a funny one from Tim. Tim, I appreciate this one. Okay, if imperfection boosts responses, why are supermarkets obsessed with the perfect fruit and veg? They must have tested it. That's a really good question. Um, so there's one thing that one thing that I would say is that there's a company called Oddbox in the UK who purely sell imperfect fruit and vegetables, and they've seen a lot of growth recently. So maybe the supermarkets ha- are missing a trick. Sainsbury's, which is a, a major supermarket chain in the UK, one of the top three or four, have a whole range called Imperfectly Tasty, I think. And that's like cheaper veg, which is wonky and too big and too small and all of that stuff. I think the reason why every supermarket has perfect looking vegetables is because all the supermarkets copy one another. Supermarkets, if you work in a supermarket, I feel sorry for you as a marketer or as a a designer because everything looks identical. There's subtle differences, but the store layout, the the size of the aisles, where you have your fruit and veg, everything looks so similar. And I think it's got to the stage where in this hyper-competitive industry with huge market share and huge stakeholders, it's really difficult to go into your business and say, oh, um, Mr. Stakeholder, Mr. Boss, loads of people, Mrs. Boss, loads of people at the top, loads of shareholders who are deciding, you know, what this company should do. It's really difficult to go and try something really sort of wacky like that. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's not. And I think we will see more and more smaller companies eat away at this and apply some of these principles. Um, And then final point to that is the reduced to clear section of a supermarket is almost always one of the most popular parts. And that's that's usually because there's something wrong with those things, you know, they're going out of date. So there are still examples of how this can be applied in a supermarket. So we've got time for a couple more questions here. Um, Phil, you are just getting through these. So let's go. Are, Come on. I'm so impressed. Okay. Patrick, Patrick asks, the pratfall effect seems like a risky strategy to apply. When could it backfire or when should it not be used? Yeah, good question. So probably similar to the answer earlier, it will backfire if you don't also showcase your strength. It's, it's a good parallel example of this actually, which is Steve Jobs. Now, Steve Jobs, um, if you listen to any sort of or read anything about Steve Jobs, you'll you'll realize he had this really intense uh, management strategy. He he once hired someone by telling them how shit their work was. He said, it was a Xerox engineer, and he said, everything you've done up to now has been shit. You should come and join me. And they joined. They joined. So <laughs> he's got this really weird strategy of being intensely negative and getting away with it. And he can only do that because he has, he, you know, he was incredibly intelligent, incredibly creative, a one of a kind genius. And if normal people, if I tried to apply Steve Jobs management technique, I'd, I'd, I, I mean, I wouldn't be working, <laughs> I'd be unemployed. So you really need to match a negative aspect with a positive mm-hmm. aspect. You know, Avis, they say, we're second, so we try harder. 
you know, that's highlighting a negative. They're not number one. There's also a positive there. They're second. Marmite, you either love it or you hate it. Yes, that's a huge negative. But there's also suggesting a positive there as well. So I think finding the balance is the important thing with a practical effect. I mean, I think we all want to know if you love or hate Marmite. <laughs> I love it. I love it to a bad degree. <laughs> I, I mean, I've I've been known to mix it with peanut butter and have that. Oh. That's delicious. Okay, well, that might make it palatable. Okay, I think we've got time for two more questions. Um, anonymous attendee, how would you recommend successfully implement loss aversion into abandoned cart emails? This is a good one. Great question. So this is emails where people have filled a cart and then they've gone away. Um, well, the most uh, an obvious one to do would be to say, you know, we only store your car data for 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 seven days and you've got one more day left before that data goes i think you know saying like you've got one more day to check out before mm -hmm. you you might lose these that's a good one because it applies scarcity as well with a time limit um you know you can think about how concerts and how you know musical events apply this when you can only add items to your basket for a certain yes. amount of time i think maybe having a timer on some baskets might be useful like a really long one so you've got enough time um supermarkets i know we're using supermarkets a lot of an example but if you do online delivery there's an unlimited time you can check out but there's a specific time where you have to sort of confirm your your check and your um your drop off time so probably with those emails highlighting how how you how you'll eventually lose the items in your cart if if you don't buy and then maybe also a bit of social proof as well say oh one of the items you've added to your cart if it's true don't lie but say like this is an incredibly popular item if it is it's sold 10 times in the past week there's a chance that it might go out of sale it's time to act now um probably the best example of this is it's like skyscanner with flight searches so when you search for a flight with them they'll email you and say by the way that flight's gone up by five pounds you might want to buy now that must be one of the most successful lost you know check out cart emails i think finding a variant of that for your own company would be useful yeah i think of agoda for for hotels is another great example when i'm booking hotels i'm just almost having you know a panic attack each time because <laughs> yeah. it's counting only two two play two more left two more left so yeah, <laughs> yeah that's horrible <laughs> Okay, Phil, we are done. So I'm going to share my screen now if you want to um, yeah. log off. And I will share with you all the incredible feedback I have received from so many registrants right now. Um, there's been a huge love shower for you. I want to thank everybody here for attending. And we really hope to see you um, at our next webinar, which is happening on February 23rd. It is going to be with our very own Sean Potter. He's a senior content and SEO strategist here at Hotjar. And he's going to walk you through nine ways to grow your audience with organic content that converts. So we're going to throw the link to that webinar in the chat. And we'll also be doing lots of promotion on that as well. And I think that's it, Phil. Um, we're going to have your webinar up the recording live. I know we've had a lot of questions about that. And where can folks find you? Yeah, so as I said, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, just search for Phil Agney. You can see my name on the Zoom here on there. And yeah, go and listen to the podcast, nitropodcast.com. You can sign up for my newsletter. I'll send you an email for my personal email account, so you can respond to me there if you want. I also have a course too called the Science of Marketing course, where I walk through all of the different elements of the marketing funnel and how you can apply these nudges to each of those areas of the funnel. So go to nudgepodcast.com and click course in the menu if you want to if you want to get that. But yeah, go and search for Nudge wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, Phil. And thank you to all of our participants from around the world who joined us and have a, a wonderful rest of your day, evening, morning, wherever you are. Thank Thanks, you folks. all. Cheers. Take care.